some people are more equal than others, you know. In the Supreme Court edifice in the building in Washington, it says equal justice under law. So you really have to question John Roberts when he said that Trump doesn't have to turn over his tax returns. Even after the Court of Appeals said he did have to turn over his tax returns. I cannot understand the Supreme Court anymore. Well, maybe I can. In any event, we're going to talk about equal justice under law. We're going to talk about the rule of law. We're going to talk about constitutional faithfulness, if you will, uh, with a Canadian, Ken Rogers, a Canadian businessman, who joins us from Kelowna, British Columbia. Welcome to the show, Ken. Hello, Jay. I'm pretty sure my opinion of American law may uh, disappoint you. Um, I'm, well, I'm already disappointed, so what, what do you got? Well, I don't think you can talk about the rule of law without first starting off with it, simplistically, what is the law? Because it's the difference is in, in how you describe that, it helps explain the deficiencies in the American situation. You know, uh, to me, law is a, a bunch of rules uh, that are determined by a society that that enable a group of people to live together harmoniously. You know, you can have a simple law that says when you come to a red light, you're supposed to stop. Now, most people would agree with that, you know, Americans and Canadians, but you don't have to go an inch past that before an American um, would pull out their libertarian banner uh, and say, whatever you're going to do violates my rights, you know, my freedom. Um, and so you can get uh, the stupidity of something like Texas, where you can wear your gun in, pap in public, like you were going into a saloon in the old Western days. <laughs> uh, and, or you can, um, you know, stand in a, uh, beside a, um, <clears throat> a, a voting uh, place, uh, wearing fatigues and, and carrying your uh, machine gun. You know, and, and somebody would say that's not intimidation or that's, you know, that that is not contrary to your right to vote. Um, and it's just, uh, you know, that would be un-Canadian for sure. <laughs> um, so that without, um, you know, your constitution that ranks first, you know, is part of the problem as to why you cannot really get a group of laws that make as much sense as for a civil society like most of western europe and canada um you just have these things that um you know eventually will get to where you know and you're getting there pretty quickly and if you know maybe ne next november or November the 8th, or whenever, which was when you vote, uh, but shortly thereafter, whenever the votes finished, if the uh, Republicans win, you know, and since they're no longer really just Republicans, there's really the behind the scenes empire of libertarians that are dominated, have changed it so it's no longer a, uh, the political party that it used to be. Uh, you're then going to have laws that um, uh, really are for the very wealthy and gradually move to where you've got more of an oligarchic system than you now have. And you preface that by saying we, we may not agree. And yeah. uh, uh, I don't know why you would have said that. Well, I thought I thought you'd have your American flag out and basically wave it and say that uh, if it's American, it's got to be better than anybody else's. Uh, you know, but you know, certainly your rule of law is just not the same as as in Canada. I mean, if you went to uh, Wikipedia and looked for a definition, you might say, "Oh, gee, the definition's the same." 
but but that's kind of why I says, well, you got to explain what what do you mean by law, and you know, get this set of rules. Well, it's the set of rules that are so different in the U.S. that make really the rule of law is not the same. It's not as good. Yeah. You know, I'm 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 reminded of civil law, which is not in the U.K. It's not in Canada, it's not in the US, it's, uh, it's in France and other countries in Western Europe. And um, there's not the same kind of, of emphasis on precedent, stare decisis. Uh, there's not the same kind of uh, emphasis on, you know, fancy foot uh, interpretations of old cases or the language uh, in, in, in old statutes. Um, there's not the same kind of lawyering experience. Um, but you know, there, there is a, a kind of emphasis on common sense. And, and I, <laughs> <laughs> you mean you were thinking of the Texas gun law? <laughs> well, I, I think we, we have led ourselves astray. I, I totally agree with you. And uh, in this country, um, you know, you, you can find a, a case where 99% of the people who watch the case uh, think that it's going to you know, have an outcome like X, and then surprise of surprises, it has an outcome of Y. Um, and it happens all the time. And, and you can feel the, you know, the variance, the, the, the separation of what people expect will happen in the courts, or sh they believe should happen in the courts, and what actually does happen in the courts. But it's not only the courts, as you say, it's, you know, you got to make these laws in legislatures and uh, I'd like to explore with you, you know, how it works in Canada. You have a parliament. And in parliament, there are, you know, people elected to parliament, sort of like a state legislature or a Congress. But, but they, don't, they don't run on platforms that deny elections, do they? They don't run on platforms that, uh, that include, you know, racial bigotry or hate or violence um, or... or uh, provisions that would allow the uh, officials involved to turn over an election based on the popular vote in favor of some politicized candidate. It, you well, don't have that, do you? No, but you know the reasons a little differently, and you might just you know throw up United. Uh, what is it? Citizens United. You know, to a great extent, explains that whole difference is is in Canada, um, firstly, the, um, the federal government is much stronger relative to the provinces compared to the US versus the US states. Um, but the um, uh, political contributions, um, corporations and unions may not make contributions in Canada. You cannot form one of these, you know, PACs um, and that all contributions come from individuals are, you know, elections. Uh, you know, if somebody was running for the, um, oh, let's pick Wyoming's the smallest state, and you want to run for Wyoming uh, for a uh, just a congressman rather than even the, I guess they only have one congressman as well as one, and two, but they get two senators. However, it would cost you more to run for Congress in Wyoming than it would cost to run for prime minister in Canada. Like our elections don't, you know, have the mega, mega scale of money, uh, but coming, you know, steering that uh, back to the question of law, you know, if you're going to um, have elect, elect your judges, then whoever's putting up the money uh, to pay for that judge to run is probably going to have um, uh, the net result that the judge is not unbiased. You know, so that if you would have, you know, in theory, you 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 know, you get a a picture of uh, of justice, and supposedly you have you know balance and fairness and no bias. Well, you know, the, the method by which you put your justice together 
you know, can't help but have bias. I mean, uh, it, you know, how could you possibly have people uh, before Congress uh, testifying, you know, as supposed candidates for the American Supreme Court and, you know, look, look the, uh, you know, panel in the eye and say, uh, oh, I favor the um, uh, legal precedent. You know, and a month later, they're voting to boot out, uh, you know, the, the abortion law. <laughs> you know, just ignore what, you know, they've said in a in a hearing. Uh, you know, you, it's kind of hard to take somebody like Justice Kavanaugh and say that he is not biased or, you know, for sure just shouldn't be there on that basis alone. Mm -hmm. Um, or no, that he our, was telling the truth, or that he was telling the truth when he said he he considered Roe v. Wade settled law. He wasn't telling the truth. Right. Yeah, that was my point. Yeah, and you know our Supreme Court, uh, they have to retire at age seventy five. Um. <clears throat> so I don't know if that. Uh, Straying a bit aside to help explain anything that was <laughs> in line with your question. Uh, no, no, no. I, I, but I, I want to move on to, um, you know, what I call the infection. <clears throat> so, you know, I've been writing a commentary about uh, social media lately and thinking about uh, you know what's happening to uh, Twitter under the, its new owner Elon Musk and and how influential social media is for reasons that are still not clear to me. And, and um, you know, the, the same social media that, that uh, half the country gets and is, is persuaded, you know, that Trump is a great guy, um, you get, Canada gets it. There's no way of stopping it, right? So people in Canada, they can look at social media and they can get emails, all these flood of emails from whatever side of the bubble, you know, whatever bubble they, they might be in. And they've got to be affected by this. And, 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 they, and they read the papers and watch TV and they see, and some people watch Fox News and other people watch uh, NBC and they got to be affected by the bubble. And, and so what, what I'm thinking, and I really need confirmation, is really important to me. I'm thinking that the trouble we have in this country, nobody knows the trouble that we have in this country, but maybe Canada does, because Canada is in the same language, you get all our media, every every little media you get, and it's got to be affecting somebody. So the, the 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 chaos that we have going on, and the chaos which will be much worse after next week, um, doesn't that infect Canada? Isn't it infecting people in Canada? Absolutely. Uh, you know, one thing you could say: there is no bad, ugly trait in the United States that does not exist in Canada. Fortunately, most of them exist to a much lesser extent. You know, on the flip side, there's no good righteous state in the United States that does not also exist in Canada. Um, hopefully because we have less of the um, of the ugly side, we may have more of the uh, more balanced total. Uh, but but really, we are affected by anything. I mean, we have, uh, you know, lots of racial bigotry. Uh, uh, you know, ours, um, you know, is not focused uh, to a great extent against Blacks, uh, you know, but the degree to which we have racial discrimination, against, you know, with our Native Indians is is equally as ugly as uh, the worst you can get in the southern states. I mean, we don't we don't hang them, any, but uh, <laughs> nevertheless, uh, and we don't walk around in with with our guns in Texas, you know. But but when you have things like the um, uh, the very uh, sad uh, shootings at the school in uh, in Texas, you know. Uh, you know, shortly after you end up with the governor of Texas bringing in his weird gun law uh, that, you know, everybody wander around wearing their gun, you know, without even concealing it or wear it in public and, 
you know, where what Canada does, it, you know, the minute that uh, Uvalde thing happened, uh, you know, the federal government took as took it as an opportunity to go another step further in reducing guns. You know, we had, you know, was, you know, the United States would call it a mega step to do with guns, but to us, it's just another inch going in that direction as we had that you, you know, it was against the law to, they were just trying to say, if you have a handgun, that's fine. We won't take it away from you, but you know, you can't sell it and, um, and you can't transfer it to anybody else. You know, you okay, can't, yeah. it's illegal to import it so that eventually you're going to run out, you know, where, you know, in, in some senses, we've got uh, lots of guns and gun usage. Uh, you know, we have uh, long guns on, you know, like we are ranches and farms, uh, you know, are pretty extensive, but lots of them are in a place where you need the gun. Um, and you know, long so they're common, and but you know, we don't have somebody bringing one of those guns and standing in front of a polling station. So, um, wh what about gun violence in Canada? Um, do you have school shootings? I recall there was some kind of nutcase uh, in the Maritimes, wasn't it, a year ago or so, who was on a spree to kill people. But that's you know, the only time I can remember. Usually it doesn't happen, does it? Oh, we don't have, as I said, every every rotten thing you've got, we've got. We just have less of them mm -hmm. per capita. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and a lot of, you know, things like the, um, the gun laws in the U.S. are a big part of that. Yeah. So what about the, um, um, the dog whistle phenomenon? where somebody gets up like Lindsey Graham gets up and says, uh, you know, if, uh, if Trump is indicted in Mar-a-Lago, there will be violence. And we know what that is. And when, when Trump stands in front of the Capitol on January 6th and says, uh, we got to fight like hell, um, he's really calling for violence. If, if, if a politician in the United States makes a dog whistle statement like that, does it have any effect in Canada? Uh, yes, use, use a, an example, um, you know, the, uh, we had a, a thing that probably made the news in the United States where, you know, the capital city had a whole bunch of 18 wheelers roll in you know, and park in the main streets in downtown Ottawa, such that nothing else could move. And, you know, they were beeping their horns in these 18 wheelers. And they had big signs on the front and called it the Freedom Convoy. And it would look like, you know, if you saw them coming, you'd think they were going to a Trump rally. You know, but then they sat in, in that city for, you know, you know, the level of patience was greater than you'd ever see in an American scenario. Mm -hmm. So it it takes them, you know, two, two or three weeks before anything is going to be done. But importantly, compared to, you know, any, let's call it protest in the U.S., what happens on the side of nearly every protest is in the United States, you got a whole bunch of opportunists that are trying to loot the business down the street when the police are busy dealing with the riot, you know, or the the um, the protests. So the protests tend to move to be more violent in nature. Well, here we have our you know big copycat uh, you know freedom convoy going to Ottawa. And uh, and there is no, you know, fires on the, you know, some business a block away. There's no, you know, windows broken. There's no great mess. Now, uh, I might use the, the word none, but it's still the same as in the U.S. We'll have a bit of something. 
but never the same level of illeg illegality or you know lack of good civil behavior where i would call that like respect for the law what is the rule of law you can't just have the the rule of law you you have a a rule a law but you know who obeys it like it you know and that's kind of the difference of well yeah you know I, and i was thinking you know we really should study at least for a few minutes why uh, because you know, the, the cultures are so similar in Canada and the U.S. And, and every time you look, they're, they're closer in many ways. Um, but, but in this way, there is a pervasive difference. And, and I suggest to you that maybe it's rooted in the fact um, that, that Canada is a former commonwealth. Commonwealths have a common denominator, of course. They're, they come from, from Britain. They come from the Britain notion, British notion of law, uh, and inherent in that is, um, is is perhaps a greater respect for the law, um, and and there's got to be a reason why it's different in Canada and the U.S. We here we believe that you you know it's never over till the fat lady sings, that you can appeal and appeal and appeal, and that you can reject any legal decision made by anybody and go to the next step. Um, I'm not sure how you characterize that, but there's a question of good faith in a lot of these things. And I think there's a, there's a pervasive good faith um, in you know, the Commonwealth approach, the UK approach. It's like, um, it's like the social compact. Uh, it's the essential understanding, you referred to this earlier, of the citizens um, of their relationship with the state and with other citizens. If everybody is on his own trip, looking for his own interest and be damned the country, be damned, you know, his neighbor or other members of his community, then, you know, what you have is a, a lack of respect for the rule of law. And I think that's what we have had and it's sort of emerging to a greater degree now. And I think in Canada, you have a greater respect under the social compact that binds everyone. Well, um, I agree with that conclusion today, but um, you know, many, many, many moons ago when I was a young college student, uh, I was a graduate student in New York City, uh, and I would have said today, um, is far different the uh, comparison between between Canada and the U.S. than then, like you know, in the mid 1960s, uh, I would say the rule of law in Canada and the U.S. were a lot closer than they are today, uh, and it's not because ours has improved. You know, it's <laughs> it's because yours has gone downhill. Now, you know, in the um, mid 1990s you know 30 years later than my experience in new york i i lived in salt lake city for a while for several years and i would again make that comment that um that the um feeling of the relative uh, rule of law or your comfort with the law was very similar in fact i you know have traveled a lot in the u.s over the years and and utah as far as it's even though it's very far right in its voting you know the rule of law feel there is is better than in most places in the united states well yeah voting that's uh, that's what we should also discuss um we have our voting as you said on um tuesday November 8th, and uh, most right-thinking people are terrified because there are those people who take the position. That, by, right, uh, by right, do you mean politically right or do you mean <laughs> right-thinking? <laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> I, I just want to understand because to me there is an immediate difference. <laughs> it's okay. You can, you can pull my chain if you wish. <laughs> But you know, it's like heads I win and tails you lose. 
whatever happens in my concept of the election laws, the rule of law as it pertains to elections, whatever happens, I win. Yeah, Ken, do you know that there are already in excess of 100 lawsuits in this country um, contesting elections, except we haven't had them yet. Uh, it's, it's quite extraordinary. <laughs> it's, it's quite extraordinary that we will litigate elections that haven't happened yet. And so, I mean, what, I think what I'm saying is, uh, you know, we, we are, we talk about decline of the rule of law there. There are so many states and, and places and legislation, legislatures that have um, abandoned the, the rule of law as it pertains to elections. They, they want to say, uh, heads I win, tail you lose. Does, does, how does that ring in Canada? Do you have people who say that? And what do you think, what do you think of the individuals here in this country, um, you know, that, that lie about the results, want to change the results, um, and want to win no matter what? Well, uh, have you read a book called Democracy in Chains? I have. Okay. The concept there is that, you know, behind the scenes, um, where there used to be a normal Republican Party, you know, there's now a, you know, full blown organization that's taken over and and it's totally different. You know, there's billionaires financing the idea that that if you have are an existing uh, member of Congress, you know, such as Cheney, you know, uh, you know, of all Republicans, it's kind of hard to say you could have anything against Cheney. You know, she just, from a Canadian point of view, she looks like, gee, if if I were a little bit on the right wing side, I'd sure be pleased to vote for her. I'd pick her over, you know, most people. And yet, because the machinery in the background is willing to threaten every single candidate, either you toe the line that you don't agree with, you know, or we will, you know, uh, eliminate your political career because we will finance, you know, the a primary against you. You know, it, it, you know exactly in her case, so that. So that the machinery behind that, that in my mind, uh, you know, for the reason I brought up that book was because it kind of lays out a long-term motive. Like why are this group of billionaires, you know, mainly backed by the Koch brothers or started by the Koch brothers at least, that, you know, what is their game plan? Why are they spending all this money? And, and really they'd like to, you know, according to the book, and I tend to agree with the, with the summary in it, that, uh, you know, they'd rather have an oligarchic state in the U.S., you know, where the very wealthy decide everything, and, uh, you know, they don't want to have, you know, just the idea of less government is the best answer to everything, you know, but their definition of less government is, you know, have you know, private jails, private schools don't have public schools, you know, and, and, you know, when you come to the rule of law and you define a jail, it's a great way to show what a disgrace the United States is as a civilized country is mm -hmm. the number of people you got in jails. And you, you, you mean to tell me of somebody who's running a jail to make a profit? Like, like, Oh, gee, you mean that helps explain why nobody gets released very easily? You know, that I, might explain why, you know, you have these, you know, next to nothing crimes like possession of marijuana that happened prior to some state bringing in the law legalizing it. And you still got the guy in jail that had the possession. I remember the book, and uh, as I recall, there was a fellow named um, Buchanan. I want to say James Buchanan, and he was a teacher in Mason University of Virginia, 
and he designed a whole change in the political landscape of the United States, uh, but he couldn't actually do his plan until he ran into the Koch brothers in, in the late 1990s. That's only 20 years ago. Um, and the Koch brothers funded his plan uh, to do these primaries and to change out the Republican Party. Uh, Buchanan died in the late 1990s, but his dream lived after him. And with the help and lots of money from the Koch brothers, um, the, the country changed. And it, it's really interesting how you can have one person or let's say a small group of conspirators like that who decide they want to wreck the country and successfully do it. They did it. They changed things out. And we're suffering from that today. Well, but, you do uh, get, oh, sorry. Yeah, we're talking about the same book, right? Yes, exactly. And, and you're correct. But, but we're, you know, on some uh, U.S. stations, which we get in Kent, of course, uh, you know, they'll have, um, you know, one of the important things in this election uh, coming up on November 8th is that, uh, you know, democracy's on the ballot. Mm -hmm. You know, well, most people don't really understand that, you know, but I tend to think that um, it's on the ballot an awful lot more than most any educated Americans think. I mean, I, if they, if the Repu if the now Republican Party, you know, which I again repeat, you know, doesn't resemble the party of years ago. I mean, even Lindsey Graham was a reasonable person a few years ago. You know, you could get the John McCain's of the world could, you know, easily get him to join some compromise in solution, and now. He looks over his shoulder and what the um, the libertarian or Koch brothers machine that now is the party, you know, or has taken it over, what they want, you know, either he salutes or he's out. Yeah, well, it's really an interesting mechanism. And I think historians will be writing about this for decades and decades and decades, assuming they are permitted to write about this. And that's another question, another show. Well, I was uh, going to ask you a question is in terms of the consequence of the election that I don't quite understand is what is the so-called commerce clause? And, and why does that, um, you know, as you may or may not know, my well-educated brother has a master's degree in political science. And, and his comment to me is if I'm talking to you about this, the, you know, make sure I you know, explain the difference, the effect the Commerce Clause will have compared to what we have in Canada. Well, I kind of went, blah, 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 blah. what do you mean? <laughs> you know, so I thought, oh, well, you know. Well, the cl I don't remember the exact language, but um, Commerce Clause but conceptually is that you have to be free to move from state to state. And it's not a, you know, a federation of independent, independent countries. It's a, uh, it's part of the you know, the concept of federalism. Uh, yes, the states have certain powers by themselves, but you, you cannot limit um, the movement of people or goods across state boundaries. Ah, okay, then I would guess, okay, the, the coming election will cause a, a reduction in the size. If the Republicans win, there will be a reduction in the federal government in the United States dramatic like well, there think, will be I think that's true. it'll be that um the commerce let's say the federal government's role from the roosevelt era that enabled uh, an awful lot of national things to happen you know if you're a genuine libertarian which i think these radicals that are now running the republican party are uh, then, you know, the elimination of the federal government's ability to shove the states around, you know, and say, you've got to do this, you know, uh, or we won't fund or we won't this or we won't that, uh, you know, that I would guess that that's, you know, the connection of that commerce clause that um, 
that can achieve the goal of the now Republicans to, you know, get down to where, you know, they don't, they don't have to pay any tax and too bad for pe people who can't afford health care or schools or anything else. Well, I know you're a student of uh, demography, demographics, and, um, you know, just look, for example, what the Supreme Court decision Dobbs did for the movement of people. So if I'm in a state which is outlawing abortion, and I have the ability to leave that state to go to another state where I can get an abortion, and by the way, this could be by country as well, um, then I will do that. So Lindsey uh, Graham can send his daughter to to Illinois, but you know, yeah, and she the may guy stay the guy that he's voting to deny that right to can't. That's right. <laughs> And, yeah. and, and I think this, is, this changes, you know, you vote with your feet. You say Illinois is a better place or Hawaii is a better place. Why would I, I stay in South Carolina where they're so, um, you know, um, they're, they're so hard on me. So I'm, I'm leaving South Carolina. And I think people will vote with their feet. This is not the only issue. If a state turns red and oppresses people, if a state you know, terminates civil rights for anyone about anything. Um, I think what's going to happen in the next few years is people are going to say, uh, you know, the hell with this noise, I'm moving to a state that's more liberal. And indeed, that may be their only option in many ways. But, but even though, you know, Washington State or Oregon or California, you know, or to a lesser extent, Colorado, you know, my states that I know reasonably well, uh, you know, even though they may be um, very Canadian in their attitude, <laughs> <laughs> um, if you have a, you know, federal government that's pushed by the Koch brother machine, uh, then they will have um, abortion being disallowed nationally. Oh, it's not. You it's, see, it's, the, it's... the idea is if, if, you know, from their perspective, if you can you know, make uh, states' rights far stronger, and then you get these red states that, um, you know, have all the gerrymandering and everything else that's kosher, uh, that uh, <clears throat> then uh, those states, you know, can, as a group, prevent any federal change in the Constitution, uh, then you know, you're just gradually going to enable that modified or the new Republican Party to make federal laws that over, you know, that force California to do dumb things. Oh, I, no, I'm totally right. Totally right. And one of the great hypocrisies is when the Supreme Court says this is up to the states. And then the Supreme Court steps in and tells the states what to do. That's hypocrisy on a national scale. And we have had that. But let me go to one last point. We're really out of time here. And, and uh, to talk about a very current news item, and that is the attack on, uh, on Paul uh, Pelosi just a few days ago. Um, this is outrage. And uh, it's an outrage also that social media makes fun of it in the way of schadenfreude. Uh, and, I wonder, you know, your your view of that from the Canadian perspective. Uh, could that happen? Um, could you have an assassination? Uh, we've had a couple of incidents like that in recent years under the Trump administration, where public officials have have been attacked, or their families have been attacked or killed. Um, does that happen in Canada? Would it happen in Canada? Uh, as I've said before, anything that's bad in the United States, we've got, <laughs> you know, we, you know, we watch the American TV, you know, our radicals, you know, hear the same crap on uh, social media or television as, as Americans, they're just the less, uh, you know, less of them per capita, and less of those problems per capita, but um uh, you know, example, we, we have a, a, you know, one of our major, we've got three political parties of significance rather than just two. 
and so we have a you know a coalition type government but um, the party that's out of power you know just put in a new leader you know and and he does stupid things like uh, you know using it in american terms the federal reserve bank in the u.s in canada it's called the bank of canada well he said you know the first thing he'd do is fire the head of the bank of canada because they should heal to you know political mm -hmm. things mm -hmm. you know missing the basic point that 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 part of the government and admin of the country you know without that independence uh you know nothing would work well yeah you're right and so that's another piece of the virus where canada catches the notion of uh politicians arguing for the destruction of in institutions that have existed for years and years and and without common sense uh wow this is a great great topic and what i've learned over the last half hour in our discussion ken is that the rule of law as you said it has to be defined what are we talking about and at the end of the day, it's uh, we have to have respect for uh, other people, uh, for their welfare, and for the institutions, the social fabric, uh, you know, that binds us together. And 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 so the the definition of law and rule of law is well. Much... What are, what are the laws that yeah. you're trying to have the rule of? Yeah, is the key piece. You know, it's the American lack of the proper laws or allowing things like you know citizens united you know that are illegal in canada yeah. that makes the difference rather than just a pure definition of rule of the law is everybody's treated equally before the law well that should apply even if the laws are dumb <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Ken, always so good to talk to you. Thank you so much. Ken Rogers, retired businessman, uh, Kelowna, British Columbia. Thank you so much for joining us. Fine, Jay. Thank you. Aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.